Do we really need the concept of infinity in mathematics? If validity in the real world was a foundational requirement of mathematics, then the debate about whether or not to use the concept of infinity would revolve around its validity. For a disbeliever in the current approach to mathematics, this issue of validity is what really matters. A mathematician can prove anything they want to if they're allowed to use non-real-world definitions and use non-real-world logic, and if they can simply reject any argument that would disprove what they want to prove. This disbeliever's argument is that the mathematician's whole approach is absurd, and they need to reinvent mathematics using physics-based axioms and rules. The onus should be on the mathematicians to justify their approach, not on disbelievers to produce a whole new body of work as a replacement for all existing mathematics. But mathematicians think they can dismiss any criticism of their approach on the basis that mathematics appears to work. This is not an acceptable reason to the disbeliever. The theory that the world was flat appeared to work until a better theory came along. And besides, mathematics doesn't work, otherwise it wouldn't have so many problem areas that they like to dismiss by calling them paradoxes or things that are counterintuitive. But instead of addressing the core argument, mathematicians prefer to challenge the disbelievers to reinvent mathematics themselves. This puts the disbelievers at a disadvantage. Instead of talking about the main issue where the disbeliever has a strong case, the focus is switched to the difficult question of how we fix the problem. Now any slight oversight by the disbeliever can be attacked and ridiculed by the mathematicians. Nevertheless, let's give it a try. Our first challenge is pi. If it isn't a real number, then what is it? Well, we can't construct a perfect circle because any shape must consist of a finite number of indivisible parts, like Planck lengths. But we can create instructions that describe a process of continual refinement, where the parts get smaller. So pi cannot be a fixed length, because such a thing cannot exist in the real world. So we might use the word pi to refer to any sequence generating algorithm with this particular geometric goal. And we still maintain that the owner should not be on us to create a new foundation for mathematics. Of course, we will be told how wrong we are. Modern mathematicians don't even think of pi as being a length. It is an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences. Which means it is the abstract structure of an infinite set containing infinitely many sequences, each of which contains infinitely many terms. If we argue that an equivalence class of infinitely many infinitely long sequences is complete and utter nonsense, then we will be accused of not understanding mathematics. The claim is that so-called real numbers can be constructed from the rational numbers, which in turn can be constructed from natural numbers. So first we must accept that all natural numbers exist. Mathematicians can appear slippery where existence is concerned. When they say that all natural numbers exist, it simply means that the concept of infinitely many of them does not lead to any inconsistencies. They'll keep telling us it's all about consistency. And we keep telling them that that makes no sense. To us, it's blatantly obvious that being valid in the real world is what really matters. Otherwise, maths is nothing more than a collection of fairy tales. So they'll keep on using as much mathematical jargon as they can, perhaps in the hope that we'll concede in the face of their superior knowledge. For us, a natural number simply represents or describes a quantity. But they will point us to the Piano axioms for a description of the natural numbers. 
We can't accept their concept of natural numbers because their jargon has no meaning in the real world. The piano axioms start with zero is a natural number. This would be okay if it related to reality, such as being the count of objects in a defined space, but it doesn't. It supposedly has its own mathematical existence. The second axiom says, the successor of any natural number is a natural number. Here, the successor is not constructed as it would need to be if it related to reality. No, this axiom asserts that all infinitely many successors supposedly already exist. To a disbeliever, this is complete garbage. A later axiom is the axiom of inductance, even though it could be argued that inductance was used in the second axiom. To a disbeliever, inductance is a slippery way to claim that infinitely many of something can somehow occur. A brain is very different to a laptop computer, but it is still a device that processes data. So the obvious thing for a number to be is a piece of data within the brain. Disbelievers can see no reason to believe that numbers are beyond physical reality and that we can somehow imagine these non-existent things. A number forms part of our description of something, such as a length, a weight, an amount of imagined cats on the moon, and so on. Other things called numbers, such as signed values, fractions, complex numbers, sequences like 0.9 recurring, and so on, are composite data items. They contain numbers along with symbols that mean other things. Also, since algorithms should obey real-world logic, then we would only ever encounter a divide by zero problem if an algorithm is constructed wrongly. So if we approach the subject correctly, we should never encounter a divide by zero problem. If numbers exist in brains, as the quantity part of descriptions, then it would be a mistake to believe their existence is somehow dependent on consistency, or that we can say infinitely many of them exist. But mathematicians won't listen to such ramblings, as they want to use their formal symbolic language, which was designed to convey their strange abstract ideas. They'll think we must be claiming that negative numbers can't exist, otherwise, how do we explain how minus one apple could exist in the real world? The answer is easy. Just as numbers describe physical quantities, other mathematical symbols, including the negative sign, must also describe physical objects or actions. Once we give the negative sign a meaning for this particular context involving apples, then minus one apple will have a meaning in our shared physical reality. A plus or minus sign can be used to represent binary states in the real world, like forwards and backwards, financial credit and debt, and so on. Once we realise that a sign represents a particular real world state, it becomes obvious that we could have more signs to represent more states, such as six perpendicular directions, then finding a square root of minus one suddenly has a real world meaning. With an understanding that these signs relate to multidirectional movement, we should be able to find other scenarios for which working with these signs would be beneficial. This makes a lot more sense than having a mysterious imaginary square root of one called I where we have to use inspired guesswork to find suitable applications for it. We can easily say as n increases instead of as n tends towards infinity, and so there is no reason to pretend that we are working with infinity. In differential calculus, 
we calculate a slope by supposedly narrowing down to an infinitely small point on an infinitely thin line. How can anyone not see how absurd this is? In integral calculus, the area under a supposedly infinitely thin line is thought of as consisting of infinitely many rectangles that are all infinitely thin. The infinitely thin, infinitely many small areas of these rectangles can supposedly add up to a non-zero area. If this isn't absurd, then nothing is. Surely we need to rework calculus to be based on smallest parts. We need to start from the very beginning by defining exactly what the subject of mathematics is all about. We have the crazy situation at the moment where there's no generally accepted definition for mathematics. One attempted definition is that mathematics is the set of all objectively verifiable chains of reasoning possible on a Turing machine. But everything can supposedly be simulated by a Turing machine. And so to avoid endless recursion, mathematics would need to be a subset of algorithms and computing, rather than the other way round. Mathematicians would detest the idea that mathematics should be relegated to being just a subset of engineering, but perhaps that's the way it should be. In the reinvention of mathematics, it might make sense to call it logical reasoning concerning quantities, and for it to be a subset of algorithms and computing. And if algorithms can encapsulate all of mathematics, then they can't be a subset of mathematics.